One of the things about values, you know, is about how we live our values as a charity and how we, it's so it's not just about how we operate in terms of our beneficiaries or our stakeholders or our partners or our supporters, but actually our staff are really important to dealing with that, to addressing some of the challenges and, and making sure that that our that we live our values with our staff is really important. Thank you so much for joining me on Nurse Wellbeing Mission podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Somewhere I would like to start then is if you could just give an overview of what the RCN Foundation is and also how you came about, you know, kind of working at the RCN Foundation and your role. Thanks, Ilman. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real privilege to be able to do this uh, with you and to talk to you about things that are close to my heart, I have to say. So the RCN Foundation is a charity and a grant maker. We're an independent charity and we support nursing and midwifery staff, including healthcare support workers and maternity support workers in a number of different ways. We make grants for uh, two individuals who are facing hardship and uh, or who would like uh, some support with education and learning and development opportunities. So we do that. We also fund Um, nursing and midwifery-led research on key issues and priorities for the foundation. Big priorities for us at the moment are around learning disability, uh, supporting the care for older people, and also uh, children and young people's mental health. So really exciting programme of work at the moment uh, to be involved in. And then sort of the third area really is um, partly through the projects that we and the funding that we give is to raise the profile of the profession and really get drive home the impact that it has on the well-being of the nation and support for nation so that's what we do how did I come to it oh so I've never really known what I've wanted to do in my career I don't really have a career path some people map it out on the back of a napkin that wasn't me and I think it's fair to say that I I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up so that's where (laughs) I'm coming from I've been my background is that I've been a charity chief executive for about 15 years yeah I think this is the 15th year actually so I've I started my career very early on as a as a speech writer uh, and media liaison for the leader of a political party which was a really random thing to start your career in um, wasn't planned at all and actually it gave me a really good grounding for the rest of my career I then went into the public sector and then decided I'd like to try some of the other sectors. So I'll go move to the private sector, try a bit of that, go to the charity sector. So started with the charity sector and just, you know, that's my jam, really. It's my calling. And I didn't want to be anywhere else after that because it aligned with my values very much uh, in terms of how I operate, how I think. So my background in, has been in the charity sector for 20 plus years. And I have just moved from one role to another which has felt right and has spoken to the skill set that I have so not really a career path pathway as such and I came here because I'm a huge believer in you know anyone who works for a charity and anybody that I recruit I would want to make sure that they are signed up to what we do and want to make a difference to our cause and the cause is really at the heart of why they've joined the charity and so for me this was you know all the personal experiences I've had and family experiences I've had I thought no this is going to be a great opportunity to support nursing and midwifery actually sort of about two months in I realized it was so much more for me and it resonated I always call it I always describe it as it took me by the scruff of my neck Mm. uh, really and said right this is really where you you want to be and this is what you want to be doing so just that opportunity, I suppose, and privilege. It's a real privilege for me to be here, to do what I do for the beneficiaries that we support. So, yeah, that's my my journey here, I guess. Amazing. You mentioned there's some personal experiences. I wonder if you could share any personal experience that helped you perhaps empathise with the people that you're supporting, the kind of grants that you guys run. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, a lot of people that I come into contact with who support the charity or who work for the sh- my charity or who who are just involved with us, for them, it's about, you know, they've had that personal experience with a nurse or a midwife or a particular health issue. And for me, well, there's a, there's a bigger bit and then there's a specific bit. So the bigger bit for me is that, you know, in my family, you know, I have had to call on 
the support of nursing staff for various things so you know I have a child with learning disabilities and he was not a child is he a man now and actually he's a great motivator for me um he teaches me something new every single day I have to say and I think the support that he's had from health professionals and from nursing staff is really immense and I just remember this one nurse that he saw every year he had a, an annual checkup and he saw this nurse and they you know they just formed a relationship and a bond that was brilliant and she did that she was the nurse for that clinic and she remembered him you know and and as she would with all of her the young people that she saw and I just thought do you know what you see hundreds of people to remember him to remember about him and things he liked you know that was really special and it made him incredibly comfortable coming to a to an appointment where he was going to get a bit jammed and poked to some degree but here she was just kind of with him at the beginning talking to him but also carrying out her clinical activities and duties but doing it in a way that 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 lowered his anxiety levels so I just think that you know and I'm sure that people that think about their experiences with nursing and midwifery staff have similar experiences in different ways it sounds like you gained a real deep respect for that individual nurse and that's helped you to appreciate the incredible role that nurses do in general with their patients, even when they're under all these demands and have lots Absolutely. of things to see. Yeah, respect is a great word, actually. I think you're right. I think there's respect on two levels for me. One is about the care and the compassion and the and the relationship building and all of that, you know, the human factor. But the other side of it is the immense respect for the expertise and the skills and the, you know, the clinical uh, experience that these individuals have, which sometimes is almost not seen, if you like. And that's one of the things for me is very much about um, making sure that we as a charity are raising that side of it as well with the public and helping the public to understand yes these are there are issues around kindness and compassion and care which are, are really important but equally the nurse in front of you the midwife in front of you is treating you from uh, and caring for you from a position of immense expertise you know and that's what we have to really bring to the fore and it's actually awe inspiring i have to say it's awe inspiring because it's all just there and i've spoken to nurses where they'll say but that's just what we do and Mm. and I say but you know it's not it's so important we've got to get that in front of the public so yeah it's a really interesting point there you you sort of refer to around the perhaps the value nurses place on themselves I don't know whether you've had this experience of people you've worked with where perhaps nurses aren't valuing their own expertise I wonder whether you could comment on that from personal experience I think that nurses don't value or a lot of nurses don't value their own expertise in quite the way that they ought to. It's there is this sense of but it's just what I do. And actually, that just what I do will find the thing that will unlock, you know, unlock what it is in that patient that is needed. I think oftentimes in a way that I think maybe some of the other professions but within health and care wouldn't necessarily do that and that's not to denigrate those other professions really important to work in that sort of multidisciplinary context but actually nursing staff I think have such a powerful role to play that sometimes they don't even realize how powerful it is and the influence and the impact that they have and I think one of the challenges for myself and for my charity is very much about raising that profile in a way through not just about talking about what they do but actually investing in the kinds of projects that bring to the fore that expertise you know it's nursing and midwifery led research projects that are just incredible and add to not just add to the body of knowledge but actually take practice forward in really tangible ways so yeah a lot to do so as we all know nurses and midwives under are under incredible pressure and rates of burnout and stress related Mm. mental Mm. and physical ill health are extremely prevalent so I was just wondering whether you could talk a little bit about how the charity's projects help to address that problem specifically yeah I think um if you take the professions uh, generally and you're standing sort of outside there are the things that stand out that scream out are things around retention and staff shortages you know that's the big 
sort of ticket news, if you like. But I think you're absolutely right, Nathan. I think that underpinning quite a lot of the issues that exist in the professions is this challenge around burnout, this challenge around mental health. And that is immensely important that we deal with that. It's immensely important that actually we raise the profile of the fact that this is a big issue that needs addressing in a very specific way. So I think that's one of the things that for me, you know, we've got all of these other challenges that the professions face, but actually underpinning that, if we start to really address some issues around well-being, mental health, what can be done? I think that that's something that, you know, is really important to the future of to future of the profession and to making sure that we have enough nurses and midwives to look after us as, you know, as we get older. So I think that's definitely a brilliant synopsis that, you you know, in terms of what you've said, I think it is absolutely right that it is about nursing burnout. And, and actually that sense that particularly post-COVID, you know, what I hear is, you know, we're on our knees. We're on our knees. Mm. We need we need help. And even the if you take the hardship bit of the work that my charity delivers, we talk about financial hardship. But the biggest underlying factor for many, the thing that has tipped them, if you like, into financial hardship are mental is mental ill health. So it's pervasive in all sorts of ways. And it's definitely something that we are that we support in terms of projects that we fund uh, we are working, we've worked with the King's Fund on a project that looks at exactly this and the impact of mental health, stress, burnout, well-being, all of that on the professions during COVID, which was, as you can imagine, exacerbated and kind of coming up with, hopefully, some ideas around how we take that forward, how we address that in the future, because I don't want to be in a charity that in 10 years time commissions another report like like the King's Fund report and we're saying the same things we just then we haven't made any progress well it's amazing that you have that focus and it's clearly very very helpful to individual nurses and midwives mm. but the professions in general mm. something that I'm curious about then actually is within your own organization so it's organizations that have to set an example and often this comes from the top. So as the director of the RCN Foundation, how do you think about well-being and supporting staff within the RCN Foundation? Yeah, absolutely. Really important, actually. And, and I think um, one of the things about values, you know, is about how we live our values as a charity and how we it's so it's not just about how we operate in terms of our beneficiaries or our stakeholders or our partners or our supporters but actually our staff are really important to dealing with that, to addressing some of the challenges and, and making sure that that, our, that we live our values with our staff is really important. Now, health and well-being has been, it, it's a hot topic. It's a hot topic anyway, everywhere. But how you then address that is not just about kind of initiatives or, you know, it is about taking the time to say to, to people, even the fact that you're, we're saying to people, look, your health and well-being is important to us, which is what we do say. And actually, if you've got any challenges, if you've got any issues, these are the routes that you have open and available to you to address that. We will support you. And I think that's really, really important because just that one acknowledgement that we do that in itself, it's not always enough, but actually I think it lifts people. It makes them feel actually there is somebody listening and I think listening is really important so we do lift those values in terms of that level of support the support the way that we would uh, want our beneficiaries to have the experiences that they have you know in terms of fairness and equity and you know having a sense that they're being listened to we, we need to apply that to our own staff as well so we we absolutely do I think as an organization, I feel confident in saying that only because we've been talking about it quite a lot for the last sort of three, four years. Mm. Actually, I think we do have a culture that values individuals, but also will support them when they need a bit of a helping hand. It's really important, isn't it, within an organization that the values that you have kind of posted on your website or that you're distributing to staff, are there actual actions and behaviors mm. that are happening mm. that are trickling down from a leadership team that help the staff to actually believe that those things are important and, and that they can contribute to those values and therefore the organization? It sounds like you've really worked on 
translating the organization's values into those day-to-day practices and that's what creates culture isn't it so it's, that's yeah, an organizational absolutely. culture is based yeah. on that yeah no you're absolutely right and I think you know I, I remember years and years ago someone saying to me a friend of mine who was a senior leader um, and now you'd never even think this so I'm, it's going to sound a bit archaic what I'm going to say but he said to me I've got a fantastic member of the team she's been on maternity leave she wants to come back part-time and in those days you know a long time ago or as my children would call it the black and white days mum it wasn't the culture I think the, the part-time working piece was sort of less of a you know or kind of coming back part-time after you've had children was sort of less acceptable and I remember him saying to me what do you think and I said look I said you be flexible if you're flexible with her if you provide her with the, the environment that she needs and to be able to work in the way she, she will go 110% for you you know she and I think that's what we do I think when people do when we do have a culture we work in a culture where we are recognized when we are seen when our needs are taken on board and obviously within the confines of what's right for the business I get that but actually that kind of culture I think breeds loyalty which you can't really measure in a way uh, or if you can measure it I don't know how um, but it does breed loyalty it breeds commitment it breeds you know a sense that somebody will go above and beyond because they know why they're here and they know that they're being seen so I think you're right culture is immensely important what would you say some of your other guiding principles that that direct your work in a leadership role and within the charity because I'm getting this sense that you you have some very strong values and Mm. there are some things that are kind of guiding you can you just talk a little Mm. bit more about but I suppose about your mindset how you approach things and (laughs) what's guiding you So my mindset has changed quite a lot as I've got older and then changed again more rapidly in the last three years during post-COVID. I think and that you won't you will have heard that, I'm sure, from lots of different people. Um, I haven't gone into the, you know, I want to go completely in a different direction or anything like that, or I want to resign and go live in the countryside in a hut. None of that. But definitely for me, there's much more now focus on my self-care. Because actually, if I don't look after myself, then I can't look after the people around me, whether it's in a work context or in a in a home context. You know, it's that thing about uh, when the plane's going down, you put your life jacket on first, that kind of thing, that kind of approach of that's so important, that understanding that that's self-care. Now, and then and then learning how to do it. Goodness, I'm really, really not very good naturally. My pace, my natural pace is about 100 miles an hour. And what I've had to do is learn to slow down. Now, I know, you know, it's all about mindfulness, etc. But actually, for me, it literally is almost take a deep breath and say, I'm not going to respond to that immediately or just step back. And that is a learned behaviour, which uh, I've had to bring in definitely in the last three years. I remember a really key moment for me during lockdown, just we were about six months in and we were all working online and I was part of a another bigger management team which met regularly and we (laughs) we were meeting to talk about some guidance that had been issued about how we support our staff so the my then manager at the time said right okay let's talk about what we've all been doing to look after ourselves and each of each there were four of us and the three of them talked about we did this we went for this walk and you know we did you know and I sat there feeling more and more upset and unhappy because what I was realizing is I wasn't doing any of this all I was doing was sitting down focusing on my work and I just really it was such a big moment for me because I just thought no this is not it's not uh, sustainable and it isn't it isn't sustainable so I think have it's a learned behavior to that self-care is a learned behavior and I think as a as a mum you know you're always thinking about your kids or your family etc and I, we've got generations in our family so I'm now at that stage where I'm looking up and looking looking down at both ends you know and so the self-care is really really important I think the other bit for me that is important is about starting to feel comfortable in where I'm at in my life in in terms of my own what I bring to an organization what I bring the value that I bring and, and starting to believe that actually there is that value so I think two sides of it really is that self-care side and that that believing in the value that I have, I think are really, for me now, a good place to be. 
That last bit you mentioned there about believing in, in your own value in an organization, I have to ask a little bit more about that because <laughs> it seems to me a little bit like there could be a little conversation around imposter syndrome. And, yeah. and, and I think it's so important to highlight this because yeah. I like to be vulnerable and share my experience with this all the time with my audience and people that I connect with because I think sometimes people see someone, they're in a position of leadership, they look really confident and people assume that to get there you've never had self-doubt and you've never felt (laughs) imposter syndrome but actually it's not the case at all and I like to share that I have self-doubt every week there'll be some element even you know even before this conversation with you this morning I had thoughts you know it's like oh am I going to do a good job what's this how is this going to go I'm still here talking to you and hopefully it's going pretty well but could you just talk a little bit about that because you're the director of a successful charity you've you know, you've had a, a diverse and what people would see on paper as a very successful career. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about imposter syndrome and, and that yeah. topic. Massive issue for me. Massive issue right throughout my career. So, you know, as a particularly as you become you move into leadership roles, I think it happens all the time. But actually, for me, it's happened more as I've moved into leadership roles, because I've just thought two things. One is the sort of natural sort of inclination that I have that you know, I'm not good enough, that I'm not, that I don't quite know, what am I doing here? What am I, you know, why they'll find out. But then alongside that, for me in particular, not seeing anyone that looks like me in these roles as well. That's in those early days, you know, I was a director of fundraising sort of 20 years ago, and there were no minority ethnic people with, from that background, with in fundraising, there are now, But in those days, there weren't. And I think that those two things combined have, you know, they have influenced me and impacted on me. And I've had to work really hard to make sure that that I know, again, it's about understanding my value. And I know that actually what I bring, so, uh, you know, is the right thing. So if you take this charity, I'm not a nurse, not midwife, don't have that background. My background is in the charity sector, as I've said. And I think that the board, the trustees that recruited me kind of realised they wanted somebody with that sort of charity background and expertise and credit to them. But actually, I've come in and I've had to learn a huge amount about the professions, about the cultures, about the issues, about the challenges, all of that. Now, that, I love that. I love being put in that position. But I think I've had to also understand that I've need, I've got to work a bit harder at trying to kind of understand that I've got to put the work in to do that and actually that's the that's the thing I think now I feel if I've done the work I don't feel like I'm an imposter I do feel very much more comfortable in my own skin I don't know if it's if it's just that or if it's an age thing I don't know it just I do feel very different I know that for sure and funny because I was talking about that with somebody last week where it there's a sense that I you know I know what I know and if I don't know something I'll go and find out it's as simple as that you know and and actually also you talk about the vulnerability there's no shame in saying you don't know something I'm not here to be an expert in all things gosh I really am not and if I was I'd be doing a bad job I'm here to guide to lead and I, the way I see my role in this organization is Yes, it's a, it is a successful charity. It's got a fantastic team of people, fantastic team that are delivering. But my role, in a way, is it's been handed to me. I'm the guardian of it for a little while, and then I'll hand it on to someone else. So not getting kind of territorial about it, I think it's really important as well, and understanding really what you're here for. You're here for your beneficiaries. It's that end point. I think that's what guides me and keeps me motivated and keeps me grounded in terms of what I can and can't do and I have to be good enough because actually if I'm not the people that need our support aren't going to get it brilliant I would love to know then for the future what is your grand vision what would you like to see happen with the RCN foundation where are you where are you taking things strategically and I guess you know if there are no limits what would you like to achieve with the charity I would Definitely like to do a number of things. I think one of the things is around with the hardship piece, there's always going to be hardship. And for us, it's about making sure that that when people need it, that safety net is there. As for as many people as, as need it, we provide that safety net. But the flip side of that coin is also something that we do, I think is so powerful, which is we sometimes we also provide almost a a route out of some of those situations for people and that's really important so it's not just about 
the grant and the sum of money that they're awarded, but it's also about giving them the tools to, to move out of the situation that they're in. And I think that's something that I think I'd want to see continue to grow. I think some of the underlying issues around mental health and well-being, we need to do something about that. It's not, it's been there. You know, I, I there are a number of reports that now have been written. We don't need another report telling us this is an issue. Mm. It's gotten worse since the pandemic. So what we actually need to do is take some actions. And, you know, some of the work that we've done with the King's Fund on compassionate leadership and what that looks like, you know, these are the things that will affect I think, mental health and well-being. So I think there's something about that that we I want to see more happen on that. And I think you will see more from the charity on that in the coming kind of next three years, but I can't say any more. And then for me, there's also something about growing, growing the sort of almost acting as a hothouse for nursing and midwifery researchers. Because if you look at the world of research, it sounds terribly dry and boring. Actually, that's where the change happens. You know, that's where the practice is developed and it's improved and we create the vaccines that we've seen, you know, that it's through the research. So actually, if we can create a body of nursing midwifery led researchers, which improve people's lives, which improve people's experience, you know, experiences of care. That's another area. I think that's where I'd see the charity going as well. So I think there's lots to do. There's never you know there was lots to do before covid my goodness there's so much more now and you know we're up for the challenge we're up for the challenge and i think the key for us is to try and raise the money that we that we as much money as we can so that we can deliver for for staff but also through them for the patients that they care for well Eva, this has been fascinating and really inspiring and i'm not a nurse or midwife either but <laughs> Thank you so much for your commitment and dedication to, to the professions. I'm, I'm sure all nurses and midwives listening to this will be grateful. And the people who have been recipients of, of your grants and funding, um, you know, the, the change in people's lives that, that you've helped contribute to is truly amazing. And yeah, just very inspiring listening to your, your vision there for how, where you'd like to take things. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Nathan. It's been great to be able to speak to you and to share a little bit about what motivates me. So thank you for the opportunity.